Today we are reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Feel free to follow along in your Bibles if you've got them there or on the screen as well. Let's see what God's Word has for us today. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before Him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken His seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such hostility against Himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children, my child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by Him. For the Lord disciplines those whom He loves, and chastises every child whom He accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children." For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not His children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our own good." in order that we may share in His holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. The Word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here today be acceptable and worthy in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we are wrapping up our study of the book of Hebrews, and it seems somewhat fitting that he would end uh, with an athletic metaphor to get us thinking about our faith. Uh, This time of year, it seems like there's always uh, different uh, athletic competitions that we can be off watching. Our family has spent quite a bit of time following uh, Elliot and some others uh, here around in cross country. Uh, It's been fun to see Elliot kind of get back into shape uh, and uh, get his running times down after having taken the whole last year off, and so it's always fun to kind of see that how uh, uh, the athletes will progress through the year. Uh, we've also uh, been able to catch some bobcat football uh, only when they're out there playing on the marching band field. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, college football is, is off and running, and so uh, that's been a great source of joy and heartache uh, for others as well. But there are plenty of opportunities to watch teams in action this time of year. And I don't know about you, but when you're watching a team play together, um, do you ever wonder what it takes to make a great team? Sometimes you think this when they're doing really well. More often when they're not doing so well, you begin to wonder what are the elements that have to come together to make a great team? And our first instinct is the talent, that raw talent of the athletes. Uh, some, ta- some athletes just really have this natural talent, and it seems like when you've got those on your team, you know, things, things go pretty well. And, and talent can be part of it, but it really isn't all of it, right? Because we've seen uh, probably examples of, of ordinary people coming together and as a team being able to accomplish extraordinary things, something that goes well beyond the individual talent of the members of the team. And we probably could also name examples of extraordinary players who just really couldn't quite come together and play as a team and really couldn't accomplish something. So it's got to be something more than just the natural talent of the athlete. So naturally, I think we we would look to the coach next, right? It's It's a good coach that brings together a good team. After all, a coach has to be able to grab all of that Uh, talent, natural or otherwise, from the team, uh, everything that that group has to offer and has to figure out how to make them work together to accomplish something greater than themselves uh, so that these uh, individual players can play in a way that goes beyond the individual. So a coach, a good coach will do that. Uh, So maybe it's the coaching that makes a great team. Uh, 
But really, a coach is kind of limited by whatever raw material they have coming in. So, so there's got to be something more than just the, the, the athletes and the coaching that makes a great team. And, and I think, you know, it's not really by accident that a team becomes great, right? It's not something that just randomly happens. It's something that happens through determination. A, a, a good team is formed when uh, individual players come together for hours upon hours of practice, and, and they push through weakness and pain in order to get the strength and stamina and endurance, right? And that's all something that happens through determination, the determination of the, the individual members of the team, the determination of the, the coach that pushes them and, and plans the practices, and it's through that hard work and determination that you start seeing results. And what is interesting is that here in the book of Hebrews, the author seems to compare our faith journey to that of this, this uh, athletic prowess that comes through endurance, endurance and discipline. Uh, so, we've come to the end of the book of Hebrews, and we've seen a lot so far. Last week, um, we were uh, talking about those heroes of the faith. And he was rattling off all of these people that lived and died so that we might inherit the faith that we have. And he was encouraging us, look back at these heroes, um, uh, the, the heroes in the past that we find in Scripture, the heroes in our own life. They can inspire us to live our faith in different and, and greater ways. Um, uh, and, and in today's passage, after kind of recounting all of those different faith heroes, uh, he lands on Jesus as the perfect model of our faith. And, and that should come as no surprise to us, right? The, the entire theme of this book has been the, the superiority of Christ. And so, we've seen Christ as the perfect revelation of who God is. We've seen Christ as the one who performed the perfect ministry. He who was our great high priest who entered into the heavenly temple to offer the perfect sacrifice, which was himself, his own body and blood, so that he might mediate a better covenant. So, we've seen his perfect ministry as well. And so now the author of Hebrews says even his life, the way he lived his life, can be seen as a model for us in our faith, and we should try to live into what we have seen. See, the, the, the path that we are walking through life is a path that he has already traveled. He's already been there. He's made a way for us. He leads us on that path. So really, all we have to do is keep our eyes on Christ as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and follow where He leads. So He is a model for us in that sense. So of all the different things that the, that the author could point to in Jesus' life that made Him a great model for us, the one that He points to is Christ's willingness to endure the pain and suffering of the cross on our behalf. Jesus endured the, the humiliation and the shame of that moment. He endured the, the scorn and the rebuke of sinful humanity. Jesus endured all of those things in order to be able to, to purchase for us this gift of faith and then to offer that to us as the gift of our salvation. So just as Jesus willingly took upon Himself the cross and endured its, its suffering and shame, so He calls us to, uh, to, to see Him as a model, take up our own crosses, and follow Him in faith as well. But the problem with that is, that makes it sound like Christianity is a lot of hard work, right? For me to take up my cross and follow Him, like that sounds like something's going to be demanded of me, right? And, and I don't know about you, but that's not always the way that I hear the gospel presented. Often the gospel is presented to me as, as you know what, you don't have to do anything, Right? Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. You don't have to do anything. As long as you believe something and maybe at some point in your life receive that gift by faith, you can just get on with living your life however you want to. Right? And this is unfortunately the way that grace is sometimes presented to us. Right? And, and what it is is it's a knee-jerk reaction against the, the idea of kind of earning your salvation or being able to work your way into salvation. This kind of flips to the other side and offers a cheap grace which asks nothing of us. And Hebrews reminds us that our faith in God is an active thing. There's no way to be a person of faith without actively pursuing God. And so he likens it to a, an athletic competition. In this case, he brings out a, a race as a metaphor for what our faith should look like. And there's a lot of great connections between race as a metaphor and our faith as we live it out. Uh, you know, the, 
you know, one of the first things that pops out to me is that uh, there, there is, uh, a race is an active thing and something that we engage in through an act of the will, right? A race doesn't just happen to you, right? You don't just accidentally find yourself running in a race, right? Uh, a race is an active thing that you've chosen to participate in, for better or for worse, right? Uh, and you choose to engage in it and to push yourself in it. Um, and, and in the same way, our faith is something active that we have chosen to participate in. Now, you may have been exposed to faith at a, at a young age and brought into the faith, uh, perhaps as a child, but somewhere along the way, you had to consider this faith for yourself and say, that's what I want. I want to take this faith and I want to make it my own. So we make that choice at one particular point in our life as we begin that faith journey, but we also make that choice every single day of our life when we say, I want to live for Christ or I want to live for myself. And so faith is something that we actively engage in saying, I want to live my life for something beyond uh, today and beyond myself, and I want to live for Christ. The other thing about a race is it has a direction and it has a destination, right? There aren't many races where people just, just run wherever you want to, right? Uh, that's, that's not a particularly satisfying way to race, right? There's, there's always a direction. You have to keep the direction in mind because if the finish line is there and you take off running in the opposite direction, you're not going to do particularly well in that race. And, and these same things are true in our faith journey. The whole purpose of our faith in Jesus Christ is to grow in closer union with God the Father, to get closer to Him, to grow deeper in our relationship with Him. That is the destination. That is the goal. So if we turn our back on God, it doesn't matter how fast or how far we run, we will never get closer to Him. But if our lives are aligned to Him, if we are headed towards Him, it really doesn't matter how slow and steady our pace is, we will always get to the destination as long as our purposes are aligned with His and we are heading in His direction. Now, this gets to the role that sin plays within our faith journey. The author of Hebrews talked about uh, sin as something that clings to us, something that trips us up as we try to run this race. He, he also talked about uh, this burden, this weight that just kind of weighs us down and keeps us from running freely. And I think we could take those two things and, and say that they're just talking about the same thing. He's talking about sin as being a burden, and they do have kind of a lot in common. Sin could be a burden that keeps us from, from running freely. But actually, I, thought, I think it's helpful to actually distinguish between the two, between sin that trips us up and between the burden that weighs us down. You see, sin is, is about a moral decision that we make. God says something's right and something's wrong, and we make a decision. Either we do what's right or uh, we break God's law and do what's wrong. So that is, that's sin. It's something that's clearly articulated by God as right or wrong, good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, Right? But I think when I, when I think of a weight or a burden, something that weighs me down, honestly, it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. I mean, one of the first things I think about is, is material wealth and, 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 and uh, uh, like material things that we accumulate within our life. You know, God provides for us in generous ways. He blesses us in material ways at times within our life. But the thing is, when we make our life's pursuit about pursuing material wealth and, 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 and all the different toys that we can get out of life and all the stuff, not only does the pursuit of those things take time, but now the maintenance of those things takes time as well. And all of that can just kind of bog us down. Uh, you, the same thing's true with leisure and entertainment, right? God gives us re rest. God gives us fulfillment in many different ways. But, but when our life becomes organized around seeking out nothing but leisure and entertainment within our life, that can really become a distraction to us and a burden in our main pursuit of uh, pursuing God. So those things, while not bad in and of themselves, can just kind of become a burden. Uh, they can become a distraction. They become a weight, something that we carry around with us. So, we have sin, which gets us off course and trips us up. We've got these other things that are a burden that, that weigh us down as we're trying to run. Uh, the author of Hebrews says, shake yourself free of those things. Get rid of them. Get them out of your life so you can focus on the race that's before you. So, if we're going to prepare for this race, if we're going to go for a race, what would, what would we wear? Well, in Greco-Roman times, if you were going to perform in an athletic event, you would do so in the nude. 
That's, that's the way they would do all the races, all their athletic events. It was always done naked. Right? If you want to talk about being completely free from anything that can trip you up or weigh you down, that would be one way of doing it. Now, I'm not advocating uh, this, uh, this as a new way of doing athletic events, but it does make for a powerful metaphor in terms of our faith. Imagine being able to cast off everything, just everything in our life, all the sin that trips us up, all the things that weigh us down, all of the distractions and burdens, being able to, to be free from all of those things to just pursue God. Right? That, that really should be the goal. And, and there may be seasons in our life where we kind of feel like we experience it and we can get there. There can be other times when we're struggling to get there and trying to get rid of the things that are holding us back. But, but always that's the goal, to be able to run free and uninhibited in our relationship with God. But, you know, even if we could get there, even if we could get to the point where there was nothing holding us back and nothing tripping us up, to run that race will still require endurance. It'll still require our dedication to that pursuit. We're still going to have to be able to train and condition ourselves to be able to run well. Right? Anyone who's, who's tried to start up running or some kind of physical activity in their life, you know your first time out is going to be brutal, Right? I mean, it's going to take some time to be able to get into shape. It's going to take some time before you really have the endurance to do it well. And so, uh, this is where we really need to focus on that, that, that conditioning aspect of our faith. And, and the author of Hebrews says Jesus is our, is our model in this sense because of what He endured. Now, we've talked before about how there will never be a moment in our lives where we can stop this pursuit of God. We never reach a point where we've gone far enough and we can coast. We talked about the dangers of that a few weeks ago. And so, it'll always require more and more of us. It'll always require endurance. And Jesus, as a model of that, it kind of forces us to think, have I gone as far in pursuing God as Jesus went to open the door for me? And, of course, the answer is always no, right? <laughs> Jesus is, has always done more. He's always gone farther uh, in order to, to open this door to us. And, and the author of Hebrews, it's interesting, he actually says, look, none of you have resisted sin to the point of shedding your own blood, right? None of you have gone nearly as far as you really need to to get free of, of sin and brokenness within your life. So he says, look to Christ, Look to Christ in, in terms of if, uh, what, what He has called us to endure. Live this faith life with, with discipline. Now, discipline is a, it's a word that actually comes up pretty often in this passage. You probably noticed it. Uh, the word discipline actually appears seven times within this short period that we just read from, uh, making it a pretty important word within this passage. And in particular, it speaks of the way that God disciplines us. Now, when you think of the discipline of God… Well, how do you understand that? I, I think kind of our gut reaction to begin with is discipline is about punishment. I do something wrong, God punishes me, right? That's discipline. Uh, sometimes children think of discipline that way. I get out of line, mom and dad punish me. That's what discipline is. And, and you know, with God, when we think of discipline from God, often it gets connected with images of His wrath and His judgment upon us, Right? And that's, you know, that could be an interpretation or, a, or a, you know, one way to see the correction of God or the discipline of God. But, but really, in general, the word discipline as it occurs here really just speaks in general about correction. So it's interesting, the, the, the Greek words for, for discipline are either uh, paideia or paideo, which is the kind of the, the noun and the verb form of that. But the interesting thing is the word for child in the Greek is paideon. Uh, they actually are very similar words, which kind of ties together this notion of discipline with this notion of raising a child. And that's exactly what Hebrews is doing here. Uh, Hebrews is saying the discipline that you receive from God is like a father to a child. It only comes to you because God loves you and wants to see you succeed. He wants something greater for you, and therefore, He disciplines you. And so, the discipline, no matter how severe it may seem at the time, is always done as an act of love from God to get us on the right path, keep us on the right path, and get us to the desired destination. Now, sometimes that discipline of God can be a simple correction, a simple course change within our lives. Sometimes that discipline from God is going to feel like a bit of a rebuke within our life. And sometimes that… that that uh, discipline of God is going to feel like 
punishment. It's going to feel like judgment, right? And it, the, the way I think about this is, 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 is like riding a horse. I don't know if any of you guys have ever ridden a horse before. You know, at times, you can make a horse move very simply through a, a squeeze of your legs or a, a pull of the reins. Sometimes that's all it takes to get a horse moving in the right direction. There are other times when you need a crop, you need spurs, you need a really harsh bit within their mouth. And it all depends on the situation that you find yourself in. It also depends on the horse itself, the temperament of the horse, how well the horse has been trained. I think God's discipline of us varies as well in those same ways. Sometimes it is just a simple correction. Sometimes it is a harsh rebuke. And yet, author of Hebrews reminds us that all of this is done in love. What we need to be worried about is if God isn't disciplining us or correcting us, because that means that God has given up on us, right? God would only do these things for us because He he has adopted us as His children and wants to see what's best for us. And and the, the, the length that God is willing to go is a demonstration of how great His love for us is. I mean, think about it, the length that God went to to secure your salvation, sending His own Son to live, to suffer, to die on our behalf so that we might be reconciled with God. This is a testimony to God's love for us. Now, I'm not saying that God is going to intentionally cause suffering in your life in order to bring about discipline and correction. And I'm not going to say that any time we experience suffering in our life, it must be that God is disciplining us or correcting us. We've talked about this before. This world provides plenty of suffering because of the sin in the world uh, without God adding to it. But what I am saying is God will do anything. He will do whatever it takes to get us moving in the right direction. God will do whatever it takes to get us on the path, to get us going, to get us to the destination. And sometimes we're going to experience that as a loving correction. There are going to be other times that we, like a disobedient child, are saying, why are you doing this to me, right? Because we want to do our own thing, and God is trying to correct us in a different direction. And so the author of Hebrews is reminding us that the discipline of God is always done in love. It's always meant to get us to the ultimate destination. God plays the long game here. God is not interested in short-term gains. God is always interested in getting us to the ultimate destination of our faith, which is to share in His holiness. We are called to be holy as He is holy. We are meant to have our lives be a reflection of His glory and love so that when people look at our lives, they're able to see what God's love looks like in the world. That's the destination. That's the goal. He wants to do this perfect work within us so that we might be transformed, and that's not going to happen overnight, and that's not always going to happen with us being willing, a willing participant in that project. And so God will do the disciplining work that He needs to to get us moving in the right direction. Now, we're not always going to appreciate that discipline, right? Especially not if we're a people that are into instant gratification, right? Because since God has a long game in mind, He is doing things that may not have a payoff uh, until years later. And yet, in our mind, if we're going to do something, we want to see it pay off right away. We are, unfortunately, a culture of instant gratification. We see it in a lot of different ways, right? We're a people that buy what we want right now on credit and then try to figure out how to pay for it. And then we wonder, why is there so much debt in my life, and why is it so hard to keep up with all this stuff? We're, we're, a, we're a generation that, that, that wants the joy of the marital union now without the covenant of marriage. And then we wonder, why is marriage no longer a sacred thing? Why are marriages just falling apart all around us? So we want instant gratification. We want it now. God has the long game in mind. God is going to invest in us now for the purpose of making us holy in the future. And so that's going to require discipline on our part. It's going to require endurance. And, and honestly, this is what brings us back to that, that original athletic analogy that they brought back. In order for a team to succeed, in order for an athlete to succeed, they have to condition themselves. They have to see the goal that's in mind And they have to recognize that the things that I do right now are preparing me for those things. And if you think about this, a a team accomplishes this through getting together for hours of practice together. And often that practice that they do is just small, basic 
things over and over again. The same drills. You know the drill. Just do the drill, right? And, and, and it could be really monotonous for an athlete to have to do these things over and over and over again if they didn't realize that all these basic movements add up to the more complicated plays that are to come. And if I invest myself deeply in the basics and make them just kind of rote, they just kind of come to me naturally, I don't even have to think about them, then those more complicated plays are going to come more easily. The same is actually true for us as instrumentalists as well, for musicians. Musicians have uh, just these few basic rudiments that we have to, that, that, that we have to learn, the, the, the notes, the scales, the chords, and it, become, it can become very tedious to spend all of our time practicing, right, and having to get those things, uh, you know, having to get those things down. And yet we have to realize that in order to get onto more complicated pieces of music, we've got to have these rudimentary things down just just without even thinking about them. And so, the same is true with our faith. The ways that we connect with God are not complicated. They're they're really not complicated. Uh, Things like participating in worship, lifting our hearts up to God in a time of worship, things like praying to God, things like reading Scripture, reflecting on our life or on God's work, things like fasting and and self-denial, Uh, Things like gathering together with a group or even spending time alone with God. These are not complicated things, right? But these are the basic building blocks of our faith. Now, I didn't say they're simple, right? They can be very hard at times as well. And just as, you know, any athlete doesn't always appreciate the practice that they have to do to become a great athlete, I don't think we always appreciate those, those, those actions that God desires of us in order to grow closer to Him. And yet, when we do those things, when we fill our lives with those, those basic building blocks of our faith, those basic practices of the faith, what they're doing is they are doing a work within us. They are recreating us to be the man or the woman that God has called us to be so that when we face big decisions in the world, when we face temptation in our lives, we are prepared to be faithful in those moments, right? Because really faithfulness when it comes down to it or uh, avoiding sin within our life, it, the, the challenge there is not normally knowing the difference between right and wrong. We typically know what God wants us to do and what God doesn't want us to do. God often makes it clear what is right and what is wrong. So that's not the quandary that we're in when we're facing temptation. What we're facing in temptation is a question of, do I love God enough to want to do what He wants me to do? Do I desire His righteousness in my life enough to to do what He's calling me to do in this situation? Am I willing to forsake a a, a short-term gain in this moment in order to experience the long-term goal that God has for me? Am I willing to do what's right right now, even though there's a cost to it, even though it's the hard way? Right? That's that's what we really struggle with when it comes to temptation and when it comes to sin. It's not knowing what's right and what's wrong. It's whether we have the moral courage to follow through with what God wants us to do. And that has to do with who we are. Like that's a deep question of our nature and who we are. And that's the work that God is performing within our life, transforming who we are so that we not only know what God desires of it, but we're willing to actually follow through with the plan that He has for us. All right, so sometimes uh, in those moments of doing that work, in our life, those, those simple tasks of, of worship and devotions and, and prayer time and Bible time and, and, you know, all those different things that we pull together, those aren't always going to be rapturous experiences of God's presence within our life. Sometimes they're just going to feel like work, right? There's sometimes I sit down with my Bible to do devotions, and I'm just, I'm just not there, right? I'm not feeling it. I don't, I'm not in the mood, I'm distracted, I've got other things in mind. And in that moment, there's kind of this question in my mind where I think, would it be better for me to just leave and come back and do this later? Like, if I'm not really into it, should I do it anyway? Right? And again, our, our, our athletic metaphor helps us out here a little bit because, you know, every now and then I'll ask Elliot how practice when he goes, oh, it's terrible today, right? Normally that's like running intervals that day or something like that, it's, right? It's terrible and I'm, I'm tired and I'm, I, I hurt, it's, it's painful, and it was just, it was a miserable practice, right? And 
Now, I know, I didn't do the practice, but, but I know looking at the practice from the outside, that, that, was, that was a practice that got you ready for a race, right? I mean, if, it, if you're tired and you're in pain, then you're probably much better prepared for what's coming down the road, right? Because you've done the hard work to condition yourself. And I think the same way, th- this comes with our faith as well. You know, sometimes it's like Sunday mornings, like, I just don't feel like going to church. I'm not in the mood for all those people, for, uh, you know, for... You know, I've got other things I could be doing, better things, maybe more fun things, and there's sometimes I just don't feel it. And yet, coming to worship by a mere act of will, saying, God, I don't feel like doing it, but I know it's where you want me to be, is doing something within our hearts, right? That simple act of the will. Sometimes when you don't feel like doing it, it's even a greater act of devotion. Because I know this is what God desires, I trust that God is going to do something in me through this time, and I follow through in faithfulness. And that's how we condition ourselves within our faith. We see the goal that God has for us. We see the steps that He's calling us to along that pathway, those simple acts of faith that He's given us to just grow and to thrive by ourselves and and together. And when we follow through in in faith, just by an act of the will, God's work will continue to multiply within us. And when that work begins coming to fruit, we'll realize that, that God has been preparing us to run a race and to run it in such a way that we can bring Him glory and honor. Let's pray. God, we thank You for this invitation to faith. God, all of us are in different places on that journey. Some of us are are just getting started on it. Some of us have been running for years. Some of us are excited and exuberant about our relationship with God, and some of us are just tired and worn out. And yet, God, you meet us right where we are in the midst of that. And God, you continue to encourage us. You continue to strengthen us. You continue to challenge us and sometimes correct us on that journey. And God, we are thankful for the fact that you love us enough to continue to urge us forward in this great call that you've placed within our lives. God, you always want so much far greater for ourselves than we want. And so, God, teach us how to trust you with the outcome of your work within our lives. Teach us how to be faithful in taking small steps in our faith so that we can grow closer to you, so that we can grow uh, into a, a deeper faith in you and your will and your promises in our life. God, accomplish that work in our lives. And we're going to entrust this race, we're going to entrust this future into your hands and, and allow your grace to accomplish that work within our lives. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, that pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and we pray in the words that he first taught us to pray.